Welcome. We've made it to the uh, the ultimate class before midterm break. Halfway through. So, any any questions about uh, maps, recursion, anything we've been looking at to get us started? Yeah. Are we going to be talking more about maps? Yes, we're going to be talking about maps and an important uh, kind of big idea in computer science that's going to let us make them efficient both today and uh, after midterm break. Okay. All right, so reminder of where we left off last time, talking about the map abstract data type, and there were two operations that we uh, were focused on. Anyone remember what, uh, what one of those was? Joking. Put. Yeah, we want to put a key value pair, some key associated with some value, put that into our map. Uh, would this always add a new key to our map? If there isn't an already existing key uh, that's the same as the key we're, we're putting in, if this key is already in our map, what is put going to do? Yeah, it's going to replace whatever value is previously associated with that key uh, with this new value. Uh, what's another map operation? Yeah. Get. Get. And what did our get operation do? Cam? It returns the value. Yeah, it's going to return the value that's associated with this key in our map. Couple other Operations I'll add. Contains, which takes a key. Any guesses as to what contains going to do? Is there anything? It depends on the boolean of whether or not the map has that key. Exactly. So, a way to see true or false is this key in our map. Uh, and I bet you can also guess what remove is going to do, given a key. It's going to remove the key from the map, as, as the name suggests. And last time, left off in uh, the middle of implementing a list map, which is going to use a private link list of these associations, uh, which is our way of making there be this key value pair, of kind of grouping the key and value together inside this association object. And we've gotten as far as making a constructor for our list map, which just set up our internal, our private link list of items as a, a new empty link list. And a sort of first attempt at the put, where we just made a new association and added it to our list. Uh, what is the, what part of our kind of map behavior does this version of put not account for? Like, what is the problem? Uh, if the key is already in the map. Exactly. This this does not in any way enforce that the keys in our map are unique, that there can only be each key only appears once. Doesn't do the step that if we put a key value pair in the key already exists, we need to you know change the value that's associated with that key. So we can't quite do this. We need to instead Search for the exi uh, an existing key, uh, and then uh, if found, 
replace the value, else add a new key value pair. This is sort of the logical outline of our, our put. Let's think about searching for an existing key first. So we have our list items. It has the associations that are in our map so far. Uh, anyone have a suggestion for how to get started on finding a particular association if it exists that already has this key? Maybe someone I haven't heard from yet today. How would you find if there was something in a linked list? Aiden? Use an iterator to get through it. Yes, use an iterator. I love it. And a nice way of using an iterator is to use a for each loop. So for each uh, association with key and value, uh, I'll call it um, key value pair in our items. And I can say key value pair dot get key to get the key out of it. And how would I check if this key uh, is equal to the key that I'm trying to put in the map? Everything? I'm assuming you could use like dot equals and it has a, that function. Yes, we, these are objects, so we, we definitely want to use dot equals and not, and not the double equals sign. So I can say if my key equals the key that I'm trying to uh, add. And so this is my if found, I need to replace the value. However, if I look at my association class, there's not, the, the value is private, there is no set value uh, method. So, and uh, so if I want to replace the value, I actually need to create a new association with a new value and get rid of the old one. So I want to say, okay, my items, I'm going to remove the existing key value pair, and then I'm going to items add a new association from key to value. Would you also add a method to the association class that would just set it? Yeah, so I could make a different design decision and say, okay, I'm going to allow associations to change, uh, but there are um, kind of a few reasons why it might be helpful for to have them be immutable, to have them be fixed after I first create them. Uh, a concrete one is uh, I would like it for it to not be possible for an association currently in the map for its key to change. Because if keys can change inside the map, then a key might change to be a duplicate of a key that's already in the map. And so I can avoid that potential bug by just making it so you can't change an existing association's key. And if I can't change the key, so that, that's the reason why I might, think, might want the key to be immutable. And then I could say, well, for consistency, maybe the value should also not be able to change. So it's kind of consistent in that way. Uh, it's also the case that uh, data that can't uh, change in general, um, under the hood, there are things that Java can do to make that very efficient. And so if I don't need data that can change, can be a good design to, to make it not change. But all that being said, I could go the route of making you able to switch the value inside uh, an association. 
uh, and kind of my preference here is just to, to make it so if we want a different association, we have to create a new one. And it makes it, makes it so I don't have to worry about these associations changing. Once I create them, they're, they're fixed. But yeah, I think, I think that there's not a kind of one true answer to that. Other questions at this point? Instead of dot equals, could you have done dot contains or no? Uh, you're saying like, could I have done uh, if items dot contains? Uh, no, uh, under the for loop where it says uh, if the key equals, the, could you have also replaced that with equals with contains? Uh, so this would require the key in the key value pair to have a contains method. Every object in Java has an equals method, so I can always say dot equals. Uh, contains is specifically for like a list of things we might, or a map, we might check if it contains a particular key, but this is just an, uh, uh, we're just checking does this one key equal this other key. Um, yeah, so we, we, we would need to use equals here. All right, so this is if found, replace the value. And at this point, I have completed uh, the put operation. I found a matching key, replaced it in, uh, in the map. And so I can return. I don't want to keep going around this loop or do the steps where I've gone around this loop through all of the key value pairs. None of them were ever equal to the key I'm inserting. So this key is brand new. And all I need to do is add the new key value pair to the map. Does this put method make sense? Any questions here? Jeffrey? Could you switch out the for loop with the contains method after you implement it in the map? Uh, like if it contains key. This is, yeah, this is a, uh, an interesting point. Uh, if my map has a contains method, could I use that as part of this put method? I think this is an interesting, an interesting question. Let's let's take a look at this. So my contains method, it returns a Boolean, it takes a key, and it also needs to search the map to see if the key is there. So I might say well, searching the map, I've thought of a way to do that. It's an uh, look through the associations in items. And then for each one, I need to check, does the key in that key value pair equal key? And at this point, alarm bells going off in my head. I am writing identical code to what I just wrote in this other put method. And so I'm basically implementing the same operation twice. And if I can avoid that, I always want to have a particular operation implemented just one place. For example, if I find a bug in it, I just have one place to fix it. I don't have to remember to fix it multiple places, being one, one important reason. Anyone have a suggestion for how you take code that's showing up in two places and get it to be in just one place in our class? Luke? You create a separate like, private method? Exactly, yes. This is our kind of lab two strategy with our linked list. We have these private methods that were then used and all these different public ones. Yeah, so I'll do exactly this. I'll create a private find key uh, method that's actually going to return the association that goes along with the key. And I'll just take the code that I already wrote to go through my linked list to find a key. And if I find a matching one, I'll return that association. And if I don't find any matching one, I'll return null to indicate no matching association was found. So once I have this find key method, contains becomes 
very simple. I can say, when I look for the key, did I find something that wasn't null? If I found something that wasn't null, there was a matching association. If it returned null, there was no matching association, which is exactly what contains is supposed to do. Just go through, see if the key is there. For put, it gets a little, uh, it's not quite as, quite as nice uh, in terms of making it really short, but I can first see if there's a matching key and then say if it's not null, then replace the existing value, otherwise just add a new one. <coughs> Does that make sense to uh, how find key is is avoiding having this duplicated code in these two methods? Yeah, Jeffrey. Yeah, so I was <laughs> just asking to, even though contains does what you need to do in put, since it's a public method, you can't use it inside. Uh, so yes, going back to the, the point, could we use contains here? Uh, we could use contains, uh, but I think if we look at, if we say if contains key, we still need to remove the existing key, so we'd actually have to use find key anyway in here uh, in order to, to be able to remove it. So kind of using contains here doesn't actually save us uh, any trouble? Yes, Ron. Uh, with how you wrote contains, if find key were to return null, would contains not return, or would it also return null? Uh, good question. Let me put put back to the way it was. Um, so find key here returns something or null, and I take whatever thing find key returns. And I check, is it not equal to null? And I say, is it exactly null or is it something different? So if find key returned exactly null, this expression is false. Because null does not equal null, that would be false. And so in that case, contains would return false, which is what I would want since find key returning null says the key's not there. And if find key returns an association, some object does not equal null, that's true, as they're not equal, and contains would return true, which is again, if find key finds an association, I want contains to return true. Can we go up a little? So, can you think is either true or false? I mean, up there. Here? Yeah. It is either null or an association that has this key. Got okay. Yeah, so I'm using the same idea. I'm checking if it is something or nothing, if it's null or an actual association. Other questions? All right. So to finish out our uh, other two operations here for our list map, we have uh, our get of uh, a key and we want to return the associated value. So I will get the key and return that key's value. If 
is there is this find key guaranteed to give me an association that lets me call get value. I mean, why not? Um, well, it could return null. It could return null. Someone could say get with a key that isn't actually in the map. And if I then do null.getValue, it could give me a null pointer exception. When I try and call a method with something that's actually null, Java says, hold on, that's not a valid thing to do, and throws a null pointer exception. Uh, but a null pointer exception is kind of, if I call git, a null pointer exception is sort of not what I'm expecting. Like I'm not doing anything with, with null here or calling. Uh, 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 so that is not a great exception to have happen in this case because it's sort of unrelated to the sort of operation that, the, that is being called. So what I will actually do instead is I will check if my key value pair is null, there is a kind of better exception uh, that I could trigger, which is a no such element exception, which is a built-in thing in Java. Java has a number of these kind of different built-in errors uh, that you can uh, trigger. And if someone tries to get an element from a data structure and that element doesn't exist, the no such element exception is kind of what they would expect in the case where that element doesn't exist. So there's kind of a more appropriate error than the null pointer exception that would happen otherwise. And you can think of throw as a sort of different kind of return. It's going to stop the current function and is going to send this error back up to whoever called this function. The same way that return sets a return value, but in this case, uh, uh, and without any sort of special uh, code to prevent this, kind of the error keeps going all the way up and eventually like stops the program and Java prints out its, its error message. Does that make sense? Any questions on this, this git method? Sure. If a user gets like an, I guess a no such element exception, they would. I'm assuming they then have to like rerun the program and put in a, a one that actually works instead of just like re-entering. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the um, if some program calls get with a key that doesn't exist. Uh, Either their program is going to crash due to this no such element exception, uh, or they will use uh, Java's try catch syntax to uh, handle this error appropriately. And if this try catch is sort of out of the, the scope of what we're going through today, but is kind of, whoever called this could set it up to kind of respond to an expected error. All right, remove, very similar. And remove, I'll have it return uh, the value associated with the removed key. Uh, a common thing for, for remove methods to do. And it will be almost identical to get, where I will again want to throw a no such element exception if I get back null. Uh, and before I return the value, I want to remove the pair. Uh, and in this case, these methods are very similar, uh, but at least I don't see a great way to kind of move part of this to a separate method, uh, uh, since we kind of need to insert this remove sort of in the middle of the steps from get. 
But uh, don't you have to store it before you get the value? For, uh, no. I uh, yes, I absolutely have to store it, and I, I kind of put it in this KV pair variable uh, here so that I can then get the value. Oh, so when you later. call it at 50, it will still be there? Like after you removed it? Definitely. Yeah, so this this remove is, is changing our linked list items, oh, uh, but it's not changing our, our association. So that's still around for me to get the value. Other questions? All right, well, we have completed a data structure implementation. Uh, I'm sure it won't surprise you that our next step is to analyze the performance of this implementation. And for this, I would like you to focus on the find key method. So work with the folks around you to uh, think about what would you give for the big O efficiency of find key. All right, let's talk about efficiency. Uh, someone share how you're thinking about analyzing find key. And it'd be great to hear from, from someone I haven't heard from today. Jake. Um, what's the big would be just like however many values there are on the list? Uh, why why uh, do, you, do you say that? Well, the worst case is having to search for every one. And I guess I'm just thinking of going through the form of just like each time it goes through, it searches for whatever value. So if it's at the end of the list, it'll have to do that for us. Exactly. Nicely put, that if n is our elements in the list, in the worst case, this loop has to go all the way through the list to find the key or to find that it's not there. Uh, and that's going to give us big O event. Can we do? No. Oh. Um, yeah, so our, our find key operation, it's going to be linear in terms of the number of elements, number of key value pairs that we've put uh, into our map. Uh, and we can look at the other methods. The public methods here are put, it calls find key, contains calls find key, get calls find key, remove calls find key. And so horror of horrors, every operation on our list map is kind of slow. Like when we had our link list or array list, you know, some of those operations were linear, but some of them were constant. You know, they were good at some things and uh, not good at others. Our list map is just, it's not great at, at anything. It's just kind of slow. Um, and so we're going to need some sort of new idea to make our, to like implement our map in an efficient way. Because just using a, a link list uh, is not going to, to get the job done. Uh, any questions on, on this analysis? All right, well, before we get to a new idea, we have an older idea, uh, the Chester A. Arthur idea. Uh, 21st president took over after Garfield was, was assassinated. Uh, he had been kind of added to the, the presidential ticket as sort of a kind of balance out competing factions. And uh, though he was a, a kind of loyal member of the uh, New York political machine at that time, run by the, the political boss Roscoe Conklin, uh, he had uh, been the uh, collector of the Port of, of New York, had kind of overseen all the uh, taxes on, on goods coming into to the port, um, which was a, uh, a position well known for, for corruption. Uh, he turned out to kind of be a moderate reformer. He did some civil service reform, 
uh, he he took some positive steps, uh, or at least efforts, on on civil rights and and Native American rights. Uh, he attempted to stop uh, somewhat unsuccessfully uh, Congress from passing the Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned all immigration from China for, for 10 years, despite a, a treaty the US had with, with China at that time. Um, and by the time he had finished out Garfield's term, he wasn't in great health, and he kind of didn't make much of an effort to, to run for a, a term of his own, uh, and so admittedly one of, one of our more forgettable presidents. Uh, a kind of interesting context is Politics uh, in the U.S. at the time was highly polarized, but not in the sort of liberal and conservative way that we think about now. It was very sectional. You can see from the election where, where Arthur was uh, vice president, kind of all the northern states voted for the Republican, all the southern states uh, voted for the Democrat. Uh, and kind of you had this high regional polarization, and one of the most polarizing uh, issues of the day was the, the tariff, how how much taxes there should be on, on imported goods. So uh, I, uh, we're, we're in for a, a string of, of, I'm afraid, rather forgettable presidents in this, in this period of US history. So uh, more, more of this to look forward to. All right. So data structures wise, there's a table that I want to show you. So let's say that we have a map with n key value pairs. I mean, think about different, way, different ways that we could store uh, our associations in our map implementation. And our list map used an unsorted linked list. We saw that that was linear for, for all of our operations. Uh, if we switch to an array, that wouldn't help, still be linear. Uh, even if we kept the linked list in sorted order, because we can't do binary search and like jump to the middle of a linked list, we still have to kind of go through one node at a time. Our sorted array lets us, when we're just kind of looking for uh, an element, we can do binary search and get our log in. Uh, but we know that inserting and removing from kind of the middle of an array, we have to shift stuff over. And that's going to be linear. There's some spoilers here. There's something called a balanced tree. We're going to talk a lot about these after midterm break uh, and learn all about why they could give us log n performance for uh, our map. But today, we're going to start talking about a magic array that's going to be able to do all of this in constant time. And it's going to be wonderful. So. What do we actually need in order to uh, uh, make, make the magic happen? So one thing we'll do, like our, our linked list kept all our associations in a particular order. But our map operations, none of these has anything to do with like the order of the keys. This is like, is the key there or, or not? Uh, so we're going to we're going to forget about anything to do with the order of the keys, and kind of not having to worry about that is going to. Uh, make our lives easier, but like forgetting about keeping them in order, I'd say that's kind of an, an easy thing to do. We just don't worry about it. Uh, we also are going to use the key we're going to have some way to take the key that we want to look up or put in our map and from the key compute an array index in constant time. This is not easy, but it 
we'll see. It's it's doable. Also going to need to be able to have a different index for every key and this is kind of the the, the, the magic that we're, we're, we're going to need that not only are, do we need to be able to take a key and turn it into an index in an array we're going to need to have each key be a different index and this this is going to uh, 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 we'll, we'll talk about some techniques to do this, but this third one is um, can uh, is going to rely on kind of certain reasonable assumptions, uh, and if those don't hold, uh, this yeah this whole this whole thing might might get messy. All right, so our basic idea here is. We're going to start with this step of turning a key into an array index via a process called hashing. And the basic idea is imagine that this blob is all possible keys. This blob represents all the possible keys that we, we, want, we might want to put into our uh, map. And we're going to have an array uh, and the first spot is index 0 uh, all the way up to size minus one as our last index. And I'm gonna call this array a hash table. And the idea is we need to be able to go from all possible keys into an index into this array, this hash table. And our Index is going to, uh, the idea of hashing is that our index equals h of the key, where this function h would be called a hash function. It's a function that's going to take our key and give us back our index with the idea that this index tells us where in our array, where in our hash table to put the key. Because if we can turn a key into an index into an array, that gives us sort of a slot in the array where we can store that information. With me so far? Questions on this? So when you put the key into the hash table, would the, they're not going to be all like right next to each other, but will there be like a lot of spaces in between like the keys? Yeah, that's that's a great question. What will this what will this look like um, when we actually do it? So let me go through through an example. So I'm going to pick a really simple hash function. Uh, so this we're just going to be Hashing integers. So our keys are going to be integers. Uh, I'll get to kind of keys that aren't integers uh, uh, in a bit. Uh, but for now, we're going to say our keys are integers. And uh, we're going to say our hash function of some key is just going to be key modulo the size of our hash table. And for this, uh, 
my hash table is going to have 10 slots. And so if I write down the index, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then I want to put into this hash table the following keys, 7, 18, 41, 34, and 10. And we're going to be ignoring the values for now, because if we like figure out where a key goes, we're just assuming kind of the value comes along for the ride and we're putting an association there. But we're just going to focus on the keys, because uh, uh, that's what we're using to determine where in our hash table uh, a particular thing goes. So I can go through and I've used my hash function on each of these keys to figure out where it goes. Uh, and size here is 10, since I have 10 spots in my array. And so first I put in 7. I see 7 mod 10. That gives me 7. So I put 7 in that slot in the array. And so by applying this hash function, that told me, OK, where does the key 7 go in my hash table? Then I, can, I, I use my hash function to see, OK, where does key 18 go in the hash table? What, do I, what would I get if I did 18 mod 10? Yeah, it's 8 would be what's left over when we divide 18 by 10. So, OK, 18 goes in slot 8, 41, 41 mod 10 is 1, again 1 is kind of left over if we take 10 away 4 times, so 41 would go in that slot, then it's only 34, take 10 away 3 times, and 10, there's nothing left over when we divide by 10, and so that would go in slot zero. Yeah, Lynn? What happens if two end up over in the same spot? Excellent question. Two keys in the same index. That is called a collision or a hash collision. And our hash table is absolutely going to need to deal with that, uh, but you will have to wait until next Wednesday to find out how we're going to deal with that. But yes, this is a huge issue in terms of actually making hash tables work, uh, because we can definitely have two, two end up in the same place. Aiden. So is the hash function always like a mod size or whatever, or modulo size, or can it, is it like just, it be like anything that just separates the values? Yeah, so this is this is an interesting question. Uh, this mod size, in order to take, so you can think of it, we do some operation with the key. In this case, because our key is already a number, we can just use that number. And then in order to turn that number into an index in our array, we need to mod it by the size of the array. It's like if we just use 18 as an index into our 10 spot array, it's going to be past the end. Uh, and we can't do that. Uh, but any number, take it mod the table size, it will give us a valid index. It will give us something between 0 and size minus 1. So it's de it will definitely be an index. So this mod size will always be a part of, of hashing. Okay. Uh, what if like, our piece was like strings? Would that convert it into like... Uh, the length of the string? Yes, I love that you asked this question because I am prepared to tell you how we turn strings into a key. So our challenge is
we need to convert our string key to an integer. Because if we get our string to be an integer, then we can do the mod size and turn it into an index. So the real challenge is, let's turn our string into an integer. And this isn't the only way to do it, but as I will demonstrate, the way I'm about to tell you is how Java does it. So let's say that our possible keys are k equals s0, s1, s2, up to sm. Uh, I guess it would be m minus 1. Where each of these is a character, uh, and, and that just means uh, uh, each of these characters in Java represented as uh, an integer 0 to 65,535. Uh, so we, we're going to think of our string as kind of made up as this sequence of individual characters, each of which is an integer. And we could take uh, there, so I'm going to write down several different hash functions that we could we could use. Uh, so we could have one hash function uh, be our first character mod size. Have another hash function that is. the sum of all our characters mod size. And to remind you, our goal is if we have different strings, we'd really like for those to have different hashes. That if we have the strings like hello and goodbye, like because those are different strings, we'd really like our hash function to give them different integers. Otherwise, we're, we have a, a, our collision problem. So does anyone see an issue with this hash function in terms of meeting our goal? Brian? Like two words start with the same letter, then they get the same uh, index. Exactly. That our strings hello and hello blue, two different strings, but they both start with H. And so they're going to have the same hash. That's not great. This is really simple, but it, it really does not meet our goal. Uh, how about our, our next attempt where I'm adding all the characters together? Uh, that does seem like it's, it, it's better. Uh, but could there also be a, a kind of flaw in, in this approach? Luke? If they're like different words, but or if it's the same word, but the letters are in a different order, is that what would make sense? Yeah, exactly. If, the, if we have the, the, the same letters, this doesn't account for their order at all, which is important in distinguishing different, different words. Uh, or it, you could even have different sets of letters, but you could pick them so that they add up to the same number, even though they have different, different letters. Uh, so yeah, this also doesn't accomplish our goal. So we want something that accounts for kind of the order of the letters. And so what we can do is say, all right, we're going to add the first character. And then we're going to add 31 times the second character. And then we're going to add 31 squared times our second character and up to 31 to the m minus 1 times our last character. And this whole thing, mod size. 
And so by having this sort of different factor multiplied by each of our characters, the total result of this sum now incorporates some information about the order the characters were in. That if we have the same, if we have, uh, uh, if we consider the, the, the string uh, cat versus act, same three letters, uh, but we're going to get the value of C plus the value of A times 31 plus the value of T times 31 squared versus A, then C, then T. So we would expect that even though same length of strength, same letters, the, the sum is going to be pretty different. Anybody? What if the change is at the end of the letters? Let's say you have loop at 4. So loop would technically like do S0 plus 31, S1 like the O's, and then the T would be whatever that is. But in the other side, pull would also do the same, wouldn't it? Or am I not thinking about it? Um, so you, you're saying what if we had loop versus pool? Uh, switch the L and the P. Mm -hmm. uh, so in loop, we had the value of L and the value of P times 31 cubed. Mm -hmm. And in pool, it's the other way around. We have the value of P plus the value of L times 31 cubed. So is the value the uh, the index in the word, or are you talking about their uh, Unicode value? Uh, I am talking about their Unicode oh, value, okay. yes. Good, good clarifying point. The, the kind of value each of these have is some number between 0 and 65,000 that indicates like which letter it is. Um, yeah, so each letter has a, a different value. Yeah, that, that, that's important for this to work. Other questions? Luke? Why is it your be noise 31? Like that's the number. So uh, I believe 31 is a good choice here because it is one less than a power of 2. Uh, and the reason being that uh, our numbers are uh, our numbers are represented in in binary, and you can think of if we were multiplying by something that was a power of two, it would kind of be, it would end up kind of shifting our our bits over by like a consistent number of spaces, whereas one less than a power of two kind of introduces more kind of uh, more unpredictable change in the final value, uh, even if there's just one letter different. Um, yeah, so I don't think there's something like 31 is just something that someone picked at some point. It kind of turned well to turned out to work well in practice. But I think the kind of important thing is we want some uh, a prime number one less than a power of two. Kind of helps uh, the overall result kind of be very sensitive to even changing a single letter in our string. So. I told you I would uh, demonstrate that our, uh, this, this approach is actually what Java does. So I will make a public class hash test, save it so it knows that it's a Java file, and then make a main method, and in this method, oops, there we go. Every object in Java, just like it has an equals method, also has a hash code method, which is uh, basically the, the, the part of these hash functions without the mod size part. So as we'll talk about after midterm break, kind of which parts of the code do kind of which parts of the hash function uh, are can be can be different in Java? This hash code does the part except for the mod size. So a hash code is just a way of turning an object into an integer, and any object can be can be turned into an integer this way. So for like use on a character, does it just give it a Unicode value then? Uh, let's find that out as well. So a character is not an object. 
It's a primitive. Yeah. And so uh, we would need to make it a, we need to use the object version of hash code. Um, oh, VS Code is telling me that there's a better way to do this. I don't care. <laughs> don't have time for that. All right, so we can see what the, the hash code of the letter A is, uh, but then there's a string with 1A, string with 2A, string with 3A. And then I'll make a blank line. Uh, so let's just run this, make sure that it works. Yeah, so we see that the hash code of our character object returns the kind of Unicode value of the character A, 97. Uh, and our one character string, our kind of one letter string does the same. It's just S0. Uh, and then we see 3,000 and 96,000 for AA and AAA. So let's actually check, do these. If we do 97 plus 97 times 31, and 97 times 31 times 31, this is our S0 plus S1 times 31 plus S2 times 31 squared. We want to see, do those actually match up with what our hash code is returning? And indeed they do. So we can show that Java is actually using this uh, formula to get the hash to like turn a string into an integer. And it's because this formula turns out to accomplish this goal of different strings goes very different numbers pretty well. Like it's, uh, I think you can't design something that is, is necessarily perfect uh, that would cover all possible strings, but this one does pretty good. Questions on, on this example or any of this hashing stuff? Jeffrey. Uh, is hashing only created <coughs> for, um, to use like the map more effectively, or does it have, have a lot of other um, advantages too? Uh, it's a great question. Is hashing just for doing maps, or is it for other things as well? Uh, for our purposes, it's going to be for like efficiently finding a spot in an array. Uh, but it does have applications to uh, cryptography um, and uh, for, um, yeah. So, so there, are, there are many uses of hashing. This is kind of a, a big idea in computer science. Um, but it's also going to let us do a lot better than the list map. More on this after midterm break. That's it for today. Uh, remember that the lab four do uh, tonight. If you haven't submitted it yet, let me know about late days and have a great midterm break. See you on Wednesday.